this was, to a certain extent, a, a history of, of, of my information gathering once I became a U.S. Senator. And this chart actually started a concept the first day right after I was elected. Jim DeMint sent me a, a book called The Rules and Procedures of the United States Senate. Boring. I mean, man, if you, if you want a book to put you to sleep, take a nap by, that's it. But there was a small little section there that described the cloture vote. The United States Senate, by the way, was, a, was, a, was the chamber, the branch of government that was uniquely designed to limit the growth of government. As Washington said, it was, it was the saucer beneath the cup of tea, meant to cool the tea, the passions of the time, the piece of legislation. So it worked too effectively at limiting government for some. So in 1917, the Senate changed their rules and allowed the cloture vote, which allowed debate to be ended with a vote of two-thirds of the body. That was the threshold, two-thirds. That wasn't good enough for some. A number of times senators tried to change that, lower that threshold. Finally, Walter Mondale succeeded in 1975 and lowered that to three-fifths, or in today's Senate, that's 60 votes. So as I was reading that, I was going, you know, when it, they made it easier for government to grow, I, I wonder how government responded. I had no idea that 100 years ago, the federal government was 2% of our economy. Two cents of every dollar f flowed through the federal government. Back then, state and local governments were 5%. So total government was 7%. Sounds kind of quaint, doesn't it? That, by the way, was the vision of our founding fathers, government close to the governed, where they would be held more accountable, more responsible to the people they were governing. Currently, the federal government is 24 percent. 24 cents of every dollar flows through the federal government. Attack on state and local government, you're up to 40 percent. We're at the lower level of European-style socialism. So to me, if there's, if there's a root cause to our problem, from a standpoint of metrics, it is the size, it's the scope, all the rules, all the regulation, all the government's intrusion into our lives, and the resulting cost of government as represented by government share of our total economy. That's the metric. That's what we have to work on. That's what we have to start reducing. Now, are we going to get back to 2%? If I had my druthers, we'd move in that direction. But how about we just get back to 18%, which is the average amount of revenue we've, we've been able to raise over the last 50 years, Regar regardless, by the way, of our marginal tax rate, 18%. That's what we need to do if we're actually going to balance our budget and live within our means. Next slide. I hear a lot of these slides are all about dispelling myths. And we hear all the time about the draconian cuts. You know, I, I heard about it so often I got sick of it, I, I, I produce a graph. Ten years ago, the federal government spent $2 trillion. This year, we'll spend $3.8 trillion. We've doubled spending, virtually doubled spending in just ten years. And the argument moving forward, you know, that rotten Paul Ryan and, the, and those rascal Republicans in the House, in ten years, they would spend $4.9 trillion. Obama, in his budget, would spend $6 trillion. Are you seeing any draconian cuts? All we're trying to do is reduce the rate of growth in spending. By the way, Obama, his, his, his last budget, his last two budgets, three votes in, this, in the United States Congress, final tally, zero to 610. Now, you want a stunning repudiation of leadership, an example of a total abdication of responsibility and leadership, it's that. Putting forward budgets that not a member of your own party willing to vote for, unbelievable. Another way of looking at this is 10-year spending. In the, in the decade of the 90s, basically, the, total, the ge government spent $17 trillion over 10 years. The last 10 years, it spent $30 trillion. And again, moving forward, the argument is, according to the House budget, they'd spend $40 trillion. Obama wants to spend forty seven. Again, no, no draconian cuts. Next. You've all seen different charts in describing our, our nation's level of debt. I like this one because it starts tail end of Ronald Reagan's administration when our federal debt stood at $2.3 trillion. Now keep in mind, it took us 200 years to incur $2.3 trillion worth of debt. We are about to hit $16 trillion. We're a few days away from it. $16 trillion, which is, exceeds the size of our economy now. Another important metric, by the way, debt to GDP ratio. We are at an unsustainable level. According to President Obama's budget in 2022 will be $26 trillion. The reason I like starting here is during the debt ceiling debate, 
The Budget Control Act gave the President the authority to increase our debt ceiling by $2.1 trillion. We'll go through that in less than two years. Just kind of puts it in perspective. Next chart. I hear all the time that what caused the, caused, causes the debt and deficit is the war and the Bush tax cuts. So I did a chart. <laughs> Four years of spending under this administration will total $14.4 trillion. You can kind of see the breakdown in the different programs. The deficit during that time period will be $5.3 trillion. That translates to 37 cents of every dollar spent is borrowed. The total cost of the war and the tax cuts during these four years is about $1.2 trillion, which leaves $4.1 trillion of deficit caused by what? Spending. We have a spending problem here. Next chart. Hmm. I haven't yet publicly called President Obama a liar, but I'm saying he lies. <laughs> Slight diplomatic difference. Back in September of 2011, when he first proposed the Buffett Rule, and this is a quote out of his speech, basically. He said, not only if we enact this will it pay for my jobs bill, but it will stabilize the debt and deficit. Now, on the Senate floor, I, I, so I did a chart. On the Senate floor, I said, I don't know what you call that statement, but whatever it was, it was a doozy. Five or four years of President Obama's deficits are $5.3 trillion. The Buffett rule over four years would, would raise $20 billion. $20 billion does not stabilize $5,300 billion. By the way, on an annual basis, the Buffett rule raises $5 billion, which is 11 hours worth of spending. That's what President Obama is telling the American people will solve our problem. Now, that's a stunning realization, guys. And I, I don't know how to combat that. I mean, we have the truth on our side here, but unfortunately, in the media, politically, when Obama stands up there and goes, I, you know, we, gotta, we can solve this, just make the rich pay their fair share. Well, this is his definition of making the rich pay their fair share, and it doesn't come, come, doesn't come even close. Next slide. Uh, I hear it all the time. Bernie Sanders, don't listen, Senator Johnson. Social Security is solvent till the year 2035. Well, here, here are the facts from the Social Security Administration. We went cash negative in 2010 with the payroll holiday, or payroll tax holiday, um, by about $51, trillion, $51 billion. Last year, we were cash negative by $46 billion. In other words, we're taking in less than we're paying out in benefits and Social Security. That started in 2010. What all those red bars represent is $6 trillion worth of cash hemorrhaging from the Social Security program. Now, how do they claim that that's solvent? Supposedly, we have this $2.5 trillion trust fund. We do have it. I guess there's a file cabinet that actually has these government notes sitting in there. But understand, a U.S. government note in the hands of the U.S. government <laughs> I mean, this is a direct analogy. It's like if you had 20 bucks and you spent it, by the way, they spent it, it's gone, it doesn't exist, and you write yourself a note for $20, put it in your pocket and say, I got 20 bucks. No, you don't. You're going to have to take that note and you're going to have to hand it to somebody and say, here's my marker, give me $20. Well, that's what the U.S. government has to do. They don't have $2.5 trillion. They can, they can, by the way, print a note any day of the week, and they do. Social Security is not sustainable. By the way, you are currently, now you are the generation, by the way, that actually has paid in more money than you will get in benefits. Medicare, on the other hand, a, a current two-wage earner couple, retiring in 2010, earning an average rate, wage, will have paid in, on average, about $116,000 into Medicare. Their expected benefits about $352,000. That's not sustainable. When, when they first passed Social Security, the retirement age was 65. Life expectancy was 62. Now, there's an entitlement program that's going to be solvent for a while. And they actually called it, it was old age survivor insurance. It was an insurance plan, not a retirement plan. This, this by the way, this is a Ponzi scheme. Well, it, it really isn't because when the federal government runs a Ponzi scheme, it's legal. So you can't call it a Ponzi scheme. Next slide. 
th these are the last two slides that should scare you. Uh, actually, I think I have another one to throw it in here. We're not very good at large numbers. I mean, what is a trillion dollars? You know, I certainly recognize when we went from hundreds of billions to trillions, and we started talking one or two or three trillion, it just doesn't have the impact as talking about hundreds of billions. And we've, that's been proven. But when you take a look at the, the liabilities of the federal government, our liabilities to federal workers in terms of retirement, our federal debt, which is really now $16 trillion, plus the unfunded liability of Social Security and Medicare, that totals the most recent report, $85 trillion. To put that in perspective, the total net private asset base in the United States, small business, large business, and households, is $82 trillion. So the liabilities, the promises that this government has made exceed the entire private net asset base in the United States. And by the way, this $85 trillion figure, they keep recalculating that based on these artificially low interest rates. Two years ago, that figure was $125 trillion. Last year, it was $99 trillion. Now it's magically down to $85 trillion. And trust me, the liability isn't getting smaller. It's getting larger. I've, I've seen economists calculate this thing at $200 trillion. So nobody knows the exact figure. What you know is we've got a real problem here. And it's a problem that is not being addressed. Next. Here's part of the problem. In the 60s, 68% of the federal budget was actually appropriated. It, was, it came under some level of control. Now, Congress controlling it, that's almost an oxymoron. But the fact of the matter is it was appropriated. And 30, was that 32% then was on automatic pilot, entitlements, mandatory spending. That's almost reversed as of this year. Now you've got 35% of the budget allocated going through appropriations, discretionary spending, versus 65% on automatic pilot. In 10 years, that'll be 75, 25. And it, just think about it. Think, think about the effect on Medicare. You know, I bought health care for 31 years. When we first did it, we had $100 deductible. The next year, WPS came in, gave us a hot deal, zero deductible, and rates went down. I hopped on that until the next year, they increased our premiums 35%, switched carriers, went to $250 deductible, then 500, then 750, then 1,000, then 1,500, then 2,000. Institute HSAs, we went to high deductible plan, with the premiums we saved, over three years, we invested $5,000 per employee in an HSA. The point of that little tale is that in business, because we have to budget every year, we have to keep ourselves solvent, we adjust things. Now, people who work with me didn't particularly like their deductibles going up, but we did it every year. They got used to it. They adjusted their spending levels. We didn't go bankrupt. The federal government doesn't adjust these programs. They, they, they make them politically impossible to adjust them. And so we're going bankrupt. Last slide. Here's what really keeps me awake at night. I actually read the federal budget. I go to historical tables. I ask questions, and then I produce graphs. And this is one question. I've never seen anybody do this. It was a question I had. What, what was the average borrowing cost in the United States over time? From 1970 to the year 1999, the average borrowing cost of America was 5.3% when we were a far more creditworthy nation. Our debt to GDP ratio back then was 40 to 67%. The last three years, we've been borrowing at 1.5%, as the Federal Reserve has basically accommodated all this deficit spending. If global investors start taking a look at the United States, no longer is a reserve currency, no longer is the safe haven, and start saying, you know, I'm not going to loan you any more money, not at that rate and our interest rates start inching up. If we go back to the 30-year average of 5.3%, that 3.8% applied to our federal debt of $16 trillion is $600 billion. That's 60% of discretionary spending. That wipes out the defense budget. Or it would wipe out Medicare. Or it would wipe out almost all of Social Security. That's what we're trying to prevent. That's why we need leadership. That's what you folks need to start informing the people that work with you about. We don't have a chance of turning this thing around if we don't educate the American public. I, mean, I did this because of freedom. We're losing our freedom. We're giving it away. And the bottom line of all this is the greatest threat to our freedom is ignorance. We need you folks to get involved to start informing the people who work with you.